Kevin is a consultant and producer from East Central Saskatchewan, and after completing university in Saskatoon and numerous ag-related jobs across the prairies, he moved back to the farm in 1999. The land was ill-managed, low organic matter, low diversity, and low productivity before soil health was a thing. They changed their practices to increase organic matter through including livestock, reducing tillage, uh, increasing diversity and including forages in rotation, along with elimination of most biocides, including cover crops and now eliminating of synthetic fertilizer on their farm. They've improved their soil. So they started with dirt and now they have soil. So Kevin, I'll hand it over to you uh, and then we'll take questions after your presentation and John Mills's. So in the meantime, if anybody has questions during Kevin's presentation, please feel free to type them in the chat and we'll get to those at the right time. So go ahead, Kevin. Unmute, that'd make things a lot, lot better for everybody. Okay, so <laughs> thank you very much. Um, Glad to be here this morning. Thanks for the invitation to uh, to do the presentation. Uh, one little change in the bio is we sold our farm uh, last April, and now we moved to Olds. So a little bit of change in, uh, in in what I'm doing and how I'm doing it. So, but anyways, uh, it won't change my presentation. So cover cropping, where to start? Okay, when we start looking at cover cropping and, you know, the the one of the buzzwords right now is soil health and you know there's a lot of people talking about it and you know what is soil health and basically soil health is adding resistance to the soil to to, to fully function during you know different environmental conditions and why is it important when we reduce risk to the system we build stability so this is a picture of uh northern saskatchewan uh, this is what it looks, the soil <laughs> in quotes looks like in forest. So that'll be an interesting picture. So today our agriculture production system is broken. Um, and once again, I, I did this as a kind of generic. So using synthetics within the organic system, okay, not really a problem, but we are seeing more tillage required in order to kill some of these weeds because they're becoming a lot more, you know, resilient. And why we're seeing lower production, we're seeing lower quality, we're seeing lower margins, and at the end of the day, we're seeing declining soil health. So the the, the six main soil health principles that that I talk about is number one, maintaining a vegetative plant growing throughout the whole growing season. That's the most important thing we need to do year in year out. Number two, we need to increase the plant diversity. And this is both in as, as a, you know, getting away from, from monocultures, having uh, more different plants growing at the same time and within the rotation. We need to, once again, organic, easy, reduce the use of synthetics. But number four, so if you're skipping number three, but number four, we need to decrease the amount of tillage we do. That's the in the organic system is it a you know is it a number one is it number two is it number three depending on the farm but we need to reduce the amount of disturbance we're doing to the soil number number five we need to maintain that soil armor and that is that cover on that soil so we don't get that direct sun on it and number six and a little tricky in the vegetable production is livestock integration if we can get some animals out on the land, it's amazing how that soil responds to it. So the number one, the vegetative plant through the whole growing season, when a plant is in the vegetative stage of its life, it will release up to 80% of the carbon it captures th through photosynthesis, releasing it back into the soil as root exudate. That root exudate will now feed that soil biology. So that's, that's how we build soil. When I went to un through university, I was told that the way we build organic matter is we grow this big crop, we plow it in, bang, we have organic matter. In reality, the plant material above the ground, 80% of the carbon that is above the ground is going to gas off within three years. The more tillage you do, the faster it gasses off. 
but we're going to lose it. Where we build soil organic matter is through root exudates, through the roots, and the soil biology. Key thing to take home out of this presentation. The other new, really neat thing with this plant in the vegetative stage is it'll capture free nitrates from the soil. And why that's important is when we have high nitrates in the soil and, and low exchangeable calcium, this is what triggers a lot of weed growth. So if we can tie up that nitrate and we're dealing with a plant that's only going to be, you know, 10 centimeters tall, how much protein does that plant need? So what that plant will do is it'll keep soaking up this free nitrate because it, nitrate is a passive uptake in the plant. It will then convert that nitrate back to amino acids and proteins and other nitrogen containing compounds. And when the protein of that plant gets to that trigger level, whatever, you know, depending on what the plant type is, it's then going to release that protein amino acids and the nitrogen rich nitrogen containing compounds back into the soil. That nitrogen source cannot be used by weeds. Our upper plants, the, our cash crops that we're growing can through ver various means. So that this way it's catch and release with these nutrients. And when we can take that free nitrate and keep it low and keep it in that organic nitrogen form, we win. So if you do take that one thing out of my talk, that's it, please. Increasing plant diversity. When we start talking about plant diversity, I'm not talking about, um, okay, so if you know, have a good rotation because I'm growing wheat, I'm growing barley, I'm growing uh, uh, triticale. Those are all in the same functional plant groups. We're looking at different functional plant groups. So warm season, cool season, we're looking for annual, biennial, perennial. We're looking for grasses, legumes, and broadleaf. We want to have those different plants growing at the same time. When we start doing that, then when, I, I missed one step, we want to take a look at tap-rooted plants and fibrous root plants. So now we're using a lot more of that soil. And when we're, if any time you're, you are digging a hole in your field, get out and take a look to look at your A horizon. You should never see a straight line in your A, a horizon. You should always see these black veins pushing down deep in the soil. That's when you know you're building soil. So reducing synthetics, um, okay, like I said, really easy, but it's, it's when we start using outsourcing nutrients, what we're doing is we're taking the jobs away from the microbes. And so we need to be able to have that, have our systems so they're self-reliant. Now, when we start talking about reducing tillage, and we'll spend a lot more time here. So the reason why we want to deal with reducing our tillage, and I'm talking, you know, I'm not talking zero till per se. It'd be beautiful if, you know, we can develop that system to, to get to that zero till part in organics. And Dr. Chris Nichols, she's, she's working on it. But the, the, at the end of the day, the more tillage we do, the more damage we're doing to our fungi. The more fungi damage we have, the less less resilient we have in these, these uh, soil aggregates. So when you look at the picture that's on the screen, this is, I have a, a handheld microscope and I zoomed in on a, a plant root. So you don't see the plant root. And at no time ever, when you pull, you know, prefer dig some, some roots out of the soil and you're looking at your roots, your root should always be covered in this rhizo, rhizo sheath. So that's fancy word. So the, the root, once again, will release a bunch of, of uh, root, root exudates in the soil. That feeds the biology. So the biology is getting fed. They have water. Now what do they need? They need a home. So they'll create these soil aggregates and that's where they live. Because, so this way they're going to be safe. So when you see those little hairs that are on that screen, that's the hyphae of the fungi. So it's going out and it's acting as extra roots for the plants. It's breaking down um, the harder to break down nutrients in the soil. Uh, the, the bacteria, they're in those little clusters of, of soil that you see. 
so that when we start talking about doing tillage, okay, so we're going to go out and do tillage. So number one, that's going to rip apart the hyphae. So that's bad. That means they have to regrow. But on the flip side, the tillage will increase your bacterial populations. When your bacterial populations increase, what's going to happen is they're going to break down the, the nutrients very quickly. And especially with the nitrogen, then you'll start getting a, a, a higher load of, of uh, nitrates in your soils. When we have that nitrate in the soil and there's no carbon attached to it, as, as these bacteria are growing, that bacteria, because it's going to in, you know, influence your carbon to nitrogen ratio, what's going to happen is the, the bacteria, they're looking for carbon. So if the, there's no root exudates coming into the soil, it's going to take the carbon from your organic matter. So now your organic matter starts dropping. So that's, you know, that's where we really have to watch what we're doing. And once again, that tillage is, you know, everybody says we would do a early spring tillage to get the weeds growing. Well, absolutely. Uh, if you don't do that early spring tillage and go directly into standing stubble with good soil armor and, and a wider C-to-N ratio on top, what that's going to do is suppress your weeds because you don't get that nitrate increase. So it's, a, you know, that that tillage, we have to reprogram ourselves why we're doing tillage. There's good reasons to do tillage, but there's way more reasons to look at, at reducing our tillage. So when we start talking about livestock integration, our soils were built by having these critters out on our land, grazing uh, plants, broadleafs and legumes and forbs, and then allowing it to rest. Our Doing a lot of tillage through history has reduced our natural soil fertility. So we have to look at ways of, of getting back to a more natural system. So when we have these critters walking across and they're grazing and they're hoof traffic and, and you know doing the things they do out there, it really stimulates our soil biology and gets that going and, and, and producing for a long period of time. So when I'm talking to organic producers, looking at how to, you know, to take conventional land and convert it back into organic, one of the best ways is go to a short-term pasture, whether it's annuals, biennials, go for your three years, do some intensive grazing, and then you're going to be primed because number one, you've reduced the tillage you do, you're going to be having, uh, you know, more plant diversity, you're checking off all these boxes on the soil health. So it's a really easy, good way of, of getting your soil set up for, for getting back into organics or re, revigorating organic land. So the thing where we have to start is number one, when we start talking cover cropping is your goals. What are you trying to do? You know, this is where, you know, I spend most of my time when I'm talking to people is what, are, what is your goal? What do you, what do you want to see after when we're done doing, you know, these, these cover cropping? Uh, what issues do you have, both from that soil and the, the productivity standpoint? And then how quickly do you want to get there? Because that's going to influence, you know, the, the strategies, you, strategies we use. So when you look at, the, you know, the cover cropping goals, we're going to look at some of the soil issues. Are you dealing with compaction? Are you dealing with slow water infiltration, low organic matter, poor soil aggregation, low fertility or erosion? Are we looking at production issues of low yields, low quality, or if we have livestock, is it low feed supplies or a certain time of, of the year, or is it an, a weed issue? And once again, I'm not using high tech uh, expensive equipment. Uh, this is a 1986 Borgo air seeder using one and three quarter inch hole openers uh, that I was seeding directly into uh, winter triticale that overwintered. Didn't have any plugging, didn't have much for weeds. Um, there's systems out there that work, but we have to, once again, deal with the compaction between our ears before we can open up and learn and understand how we can do these different management processes. So when we're designing blends, these goals are really, really important because that's how we're going to pick the species. And then we're going to have to look at the logistics of when we're going to seed it, how we're going to seed it, how it'll be terminated, what was the last crop, what's the next crop. So we don't want to cause any issues production wise. So that when we start going through and, you know, with these goals, I, I love this, this graph or this, this picture because, okay, we have three options. We want something that's good, cheap, fast, 
we get to pick two of them. We can't pick all three because if we pick all three, then we're in that magical zone where, but I guess if you have a herd of, of unicorns, that's, you know, we can start uh, rotation and grazing on in that, but this is what we're dealing with. So we have to try and pick two of these, you know, what are, what are our goals? How quickly you want to get there? And so uh, Cotswold C, they have a really, really uh, a good bunch of, of um, pictures like this, where you can see when I'm doing these blends, I'm thinking about above ground and I'm thinking about a below ground. When these plants are growing, how they're growing, brooding structures, all of these things when I'm doing these blends so that, you know, to throw a little bit of chicory in. I love chicory. Uh, it does some beautiful things for the soil, for, for loosening it up. It's a biennial. There's some issues there, but once again, all manageable. So this is the my uh, decision tree when we're going through and and, uh, and and doing our planning. So that, you know, there's our grasses, there's our legumes, and then there are broadleaf. But because the broadleaf is so broad, I talk about brassica, non-brassica, and forbs within the broadleaf. Within each group, we're looking for warm season, cool season species, annuals, biennials, and perennials. That's how we get the diversity. So our grasses, we have big fibrous root system, the mycorrhizal friendly, they create the ground cover, prevent erosion, create tons. We have warm season species, annuals, biennials, and perennial, perennials, uh, cool season species, annuals, biennials, and perennials. We have lots of diversity in there. So lots of things to choose from. Your legumes are probably end fixers, if properly inodulated. If you don't have the right inoculant on, maybe not. Uh, they are highly mycorrhizal, minus the lupins. Uh, how, they have high protein content. Your warm season species basically just have a few annuals we can pick from, but your cool seasons, you have annuals, biennials, and perennials. In your broadleaf, once again, very diverse groups are your brassica, non brassicas and forbs. Brassicas are your nutrient scavengers. They tend to be non-mycorrhizal as a rule, very high protein, real high relative feed value, good for smothering weeds. Basically, we have cool season species, annuals, and biennials. In our non brassicas you know, it, once again, very diverse group, and it's kind of a catch-all. So some of the species will be sunflowers, beets, buckwheat, flax. What these plants do to the soil is amazing. So to have those in rotation is a really good thing because it's a, a very low-use group that we, 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 that we have access to. And the last one is the forbs. This is one of the missing links in my mind of agriculture. So the chicory and the plantain, the phacelia. In Holland, when they're harvesting their tulip bulbs, there's only one way to harvest them, you're ripping everything up. So if you have to go in and you're doing a, you know, a plow or a disc and you're doing lots of disturbance and blackening the field, you need to put in a blend of phacelia, a really high rate of phacelia because phacelia creates soil structure is one of the, the fastest species or, or crops you can grow to build soil structure. So when they're doing tulip harvest in Holland, they'll go in and seed uh, a phacelia. And then the beekeepers start fighting over who gets the right to go and put their hives out there. Because as you see in the picture, it's crack cocaine for bees. Bees absolutely love this. It produces some of the highest quality honey you can get. So uh, chicory is a, a warm broadleaf biennial. It, it overwinters, and so second year it's going to look like a mutant flax plant. It'll be about five feet high, big flower. It tends to die after that second year unless it goes to seed. So it, it's quite manageable. And plantain, um, the native uh, uh, Canadians, they would use that as a, a, her a healing herb. So they would, if they have a, a scratch or a wound, they would chew the plantain leaves and then put that chewed plantain on their, on their wound and it would heal. When you start talking about grazing uh, livestock, plantain boosts the, the immune system of these, of the grazing animals that, that are grazing it. So a nice plant. So that is a quick rundown. I tried to uh, be as quick as I can. So I am open for uh, questions. Uh, there's my contact information. If you want to talk to me after, I'm on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, uh, through Cover Crops Canada. Um, I'll open the, the floor for, for discussion. Otherwise, I'll be around until, uh, until the break. Awesome. Thank you, Kevin. Um, so now feel free to type questions in the chat and we'll get to them after John's presentation. Uh, so we'll go to John. 
Um, and John, I can share your slides for you. Um, just let me know when to advance. So I'll give you a little bio on John. Uh, he and his family operate on 640 acres of certified organic land south of Red Deer with seed potatoes, market veggies, and agritourism being most of the farm's focus. And then with a regenerative agriculture approach, it's been easiest to separate out the different production styles of each enterprise into different areas on the farm to allow for context specific strategies of building soil health through cover cropping. Each enterprise has specific needs and utilities or utilizes cover cropping in different ways to control weeds and build soil health and prepare plots for planting the following cash crops. So over to you, John, and I will bring up your slides right away. Perfect. Well, while that's loading, so yeah, I'm going to go through a couple of examples of the timing and planting of terminating cover crops uh, in our different operations. And um, yeah, we'll just use some examples. But ultimately, we're going to start with the... Uh, is that loading there, Sarah? I can present it from my end too, if we need to. Perfect. All right. Um, excellent. So yeah, we're going to talk about some of the goals. It was good that Kevin talked about soil health. It's not so it's definitely an aspect of what we do, but not what I'm going to talk about in this presentation. So let's skip to the next slide if we could, please. Um, really what makes up a lot of our decisions um, is, I don't know about you, but we grow pretty good weeds on the farm. So utilizing and timing of cover crops to control weeds is definitely an important aspect. Uh, Plots with perennial weeds, we still use tillage to control those perennial weeds. So we'll time the tillage before and after cover crops to start to weaken the perennial plants. Annual weeds don't necessarily need tillage as a form of termination to control the annual weeds. Um, we can flail mow or we have other strategies to reduce the, um, the seed rain from annual seeds. The other thing to think about is what's gonna be the post, uh, what crops can be following the cover crop. The picture there is a great example of a cover crop, but it's a long ways away from planting something like a small seeded carrot into the following year. The specific plot, the plan is to plant potatoes, not an early planting of potatoes. We're gonna give the biomass some more time to break down. It'll maybe be mid June, we're hoping to plant potatoes in that cover crop. So let's skip to the next slide and see the first examples we have of some plots where we planted uh, garlic and potatoes. So these pictures were from 2020, uh, both planted on the same time, late July. Uh, and the plot on the left was garlic, the plot on the right was gonna be potatoes. So the reason we didn't terminate the garlic plot on the left was an idea I got from Andrew Manns about no-tilling garlic. So we wanted to experiment, and this is where the one plot we had to experiment with no-tilling garlic. The plot on the right, the reason for terminating that cover crop early September was to control and weaken some perennial weeds were in that plot, but also to start breaking down the above ground biomass. One other note on this, uh, these plots, this was the second cover crop of the season we planted. We did have an early spring cover crop as well. So let's go to the next slide where we can see a little bit further along in the rotation where it was end of October when we got around to planting the, um, it, the garlic. The cover crop had been winter killed, so it's laying flat on the ground and our no-till plant refashioned, was able to plant the garlic great through that crop. We had good garlic quality that year, good germination. You can see we covered it with hay mulch. It's pretty standard for most of our garlic plantings. The one thing that didn't work great in the timing of this cover crop was we selfishly wanted to trial the no-till garlic planting and left that cover longer than we would have for weed control purposes. So the annual uh, weeds like lamb's quarters, which were in that cover, went to seed and did cause some issues in the following uh, garlic crop. We controlled those through weed whacking. The pictures on the right with the potatoes, we planted, remember this plot was in end of July, terminated early September. And then going into winter, that top picture, we had a good amount of ground cover litter to hold the soil in place and prevent erosion but the following spring in 2021, it was minimal tillage to prepare that ground for planting the potatoes. Our potato planter can handle some trash, but not a lot of trash, which is why we need to incorporate the biomass to break it down so we can plant into 
I would like to no-till my potatoes or even reduce the tillage even more. But again, we had perennial weeds in this plot that we had to um, start to control. And also, um, you know, we're often growing two to three tons of above ground bio biomass in our cover crops. And somehow we need to take, get that into the soil uh, so our machinery can um, work through the ground. So we switch over to the next slide. It does list carrots um, in the header. Really when I'm talking about carrots, see it shortly, I'm talking about all small seeded crops. For us, it's carrots, beets, parsnips, that can include radishes and lettuces, anything that you plant with a direct seeded planter. I use a stand hay. We did see yesterday an example of a modified stand hay that could plant through trash. In our case, like the amount of trash that's on the soil is all that my planter can handle. I've experimented with higher trash situations from the previous year's cover crop, but I get poor soil to seed contact and poor germination. The picture on the right with the corn and the sunflowers, that's not a no-till corn planter by any means, but it can handle a lot more trash than what you can see in the picture. I think this picture is from about three or four years ago, and now we've reduced the tillage a lot, and there's a lot of corn stalks or material from the previous year's crop. What we have to compensate for is just a higher seeding rate in the corn and the sunflowers, knowing that the planter is going to be bouncing over those corn stalks and not get a great germination. If we skip to the next slide, we can see how we have to adjust the timing of the planting of the cover crops to create a cleaner seed bed. So last year is definitely not a great example. 2021, that late planted, late August planted cover crop wasn't as developed as I wanted to. Uh, largely due, it was really dry last year and things didn't get established. The picture on the left is kind of a more what I want to go into the winter with. Four to ten inches of, of growing cover crop. I don't want it more established than that, otherwise I'll have more trash to work in in the spring. The picture on the right, I might just be able to harrow that land and then plant my carrots into. Another thing to think about on a cleaner seed bed is maybe less grains, which would produce more carbonaceous material on the surface the following year, and more you know, legumes and brassicas, which will break down a bit easier. Now we switch over to the next slide. We're gonna kind of look at timing in a different context. These first pictures I showed you were 40 acre plots where we grow our seed potatoes, but uh, where we grow our market garden, this is one of our market garden plots. It's 10 acres and our goal for timing is to maintain some sort of living plant on at least 25% of that 10 acres throughout the year. So we do that in the first picture with, um, oh, I don't see the dates there, but that was June 22nd. So in the spring, we would have tilled the strip where we planted the potatoes. A month later, after the hilling, the potatoes are coming up. The green strips next to it was just what naturally grew in those plots, what was a mix of um, fall rye that was in the previous year's cover crop and a lot of weeds, mostly lambs quarters. I wasn't concerned about the weeds in this case. We did terminate that strip cover just shortly after the picture was taken uh, and planted to a more intentionally chosen cover crop mix. The middle picture really shows how we strip plant the field. So next to the sunflowers was beets, then I think garlic, sunflowers, carrots, potatoes, and so on down the field. Even when we get into the lat, <clears throat> the last picture on the right hand side, that was October 20, maybe October 9th. So we just finished potato harvest and potatoes are really poor uh, for soil health. There's so much soil disturbance. So we've increased the space between our potato varieties to allow us to pass our grain drill to plant a cover crop. So going into the winter, uh, we have something to catch any potential runoff from the potato land. Now in the next slide, we talking about termination, we generally use a high speed disc or historically I should say we've used a high speed disc, a 12 foot high speed disc to terminate and incorporate our cover crops. It's very good at it. I'm worried, I think that the high speed disc in that tool has created some of the compaction issues we've seen on the farm. So this year we started to experiment with a flail shredder, which I was really impressed at how it terminated the crop. It'll be interesting to see how long it takes for that biomass to decompose and prep for the next year's crop. Another option if we want to plant a small seeded crop after the cover is just to remove that above ground biomass, which we did, uh, we do most years by swathing. We actually compost, bale and compost that biomass and then use it in our transplanted vegetable production. So now the last area of the farm 
I wanted to cover was our transplanted permanent bed systems in the next slide. So we've, since 2006, uh, we started growing in plastic beds. We fashioned this uh, hoe drill to plant a cover crop between the plastic beds to create a, a living pathway. We no longer use plastic in our production systems, but we still use the machine to plant the cover crop mixes, the living pathway, lay the drip plate tape, and kind of create the structure of the kind of create the structure of our permanent bed systems. So in the next slide, we can see what that looks like, not in year one, but in year two and three and after. The nice thing about the permanent bed system, we kind of have to think about the timing in a different paradigm because 50% of my field is covered in a perennial cover at all times. So the time kind of switches instead of on when we're going in to manage that cover, we do have to mow it, but we're just free to work in that field whenever we want. It can be early spring after two inches of rain and a couple of days later, we can uh, take our machinery in that field, which always drives on the living cover and we never um, drive uh, on the beds where we grow the vegetables. So I do use a rotor tiller occasionally. I'm not totally against tillage in my permanent bed systems. And the rotor tiller enables us to utilize the white clover by pushing it back, preventing it from creeping into the vegetable rows, um, but enables us to have that perennial cover. Opposed to the bottom right, when we've played around with annuals as a living pathway, the challenge is they take time to establish in the spring so we don't have the same coverage throughout the year of a cover crop in those plots. Uh, also, we struggle with dandelions and other perennial weeds on the farm. And those perennial weeds can definitely establish in the annual cropping system, whereas I have no issues of dandelions with the white cover or white clover cover crops. Um, I've seen the white clover choke out and reduce even things like thistle and, and um, Oh, quack grasses are other issue. So whether it's spring, like in the top left picture where we're getting ready to plant or fall in the bottom picture where we're planting garlic, no-tilling garlic into those beds, uh, timing is just not an issue anymore for us on those transplanted systems. Um, so I tried to keep it quick. Hopefully that kind of covers anything and I'm ready for questions when we, if anyone has questions. Great, awesome. Thanks, John. That's really interesting. Um, all right. Looks like we're actually already out of question time. Um, so maybe what let's do is, um, John, there's a question. Well, and Kevin, there's a couple questions in the chat. If you could answer those in the chat, that'd be great. Um, and then we'll go right into a quick little five minute break before our next session. Um, so I believe we should be back around 9.15, 10.15 for those of you in Saskatchewan. So uh, take a few minutes to go get a oh, drink. Sarah. Yeah. I think there is a little, uh, there's um, still time for, uh, okay. like we're not coming back to the next session until 1025. So I think there is still okay. time. So we Let's can go into until 1020 and then still have a five minute break. Okay, perfect. Let's do that then. Um, all right. So Kevin, do you want to speak to uh, Bobby's question about the seed varieties? Okay, now I got the the mic on. Okay, so personally, uh, the the question is, uh, do do I like a mixed uh, cover crop, uh, garden bed, or one at a time? I prefer a very diverse mix, so that once again, looking at those different functional plant groups, what we don't want to do is if it's going to be seeding, um, you know, the year after after the cover crop seeding, uh, turnips, radishes, the brassicas, don't put those in your cover crop. If you're going to be seeding peas or something that, that that's a legume, don't put a legume in your cover crop before you seed it. So that's the you know that's the caveat I wouldn't do. Besides that, you know, keep the this living plant growing. It's it's key.
Yeah, awesome. Uh, we also have another question. Um, maybe Kevin and John, you might both be able to speak to this. Uh, what suggestions do you have for use of cover crops in northern areas where the season seems almost too short for cover crops? Um, I, I could start with that. Well, I guess one thing I didn't mention is that we're never cover cropping and growing a cash crop in the same year. So we are taking a plot out of production for one year to do our cover cropping, which allows us to build soil health, maintain and control weeds, and then prepare the ground the following year for vegetable production. Maybe that's something that, you know, I have the luxury of with having more acres. Um, and as far as mulch versus cover crops between the beds, we mulch in the beds. So a lot of the pictures I showed were just bare soil. We do mulch in the beds. Between the beds, I can't control perennial weeds with mulch. Even lambs quarters can, and, and stinkweed can push through three to four inches of mulch in a season, which is why we've moved to the, perm, or the, the living pathway. And we maintain that by mowing it, whether it's, um, depending on what we have in there, we just maintain it by mowing it. Not to say that the mulch wouldn't work, it just didn't work in our context. For, uh, uh, go ahead, for, Kevin. For using cover crops, I deal with people uh, up at La Crete's, I deal with people, um, Vancouver Island, PEI, um, Mississippi, you know, all these, these areas, they keep saying, well, I, I can't because I don't have enough time. And this is where the, the intercropping works really well. So using things like subterranean clover, Italian ryegrass um, to seed in with your crop, absolutely. Uh, the chaos gardens are another really good way of, of seeding gardens and adding diversity, and, but it, you know, it, it doesn't look in quotes normal. So uh, to, to have these cover crops, you know, to have, um, you know, to seed, to have your, 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 your vegetables up and going established and then introduce a, a relay cover crop. So companion cropping, you know, it's a real good way of, of shortening the days required to, to, uh, to get the benefit out of a cover crop. And uh, just to, to go back to John's comment about, uh, you know, lamb's quarters and, and red root pigweed, uh, those are two crops that are, are indicators that are they're nitrate accumulators. So that when we have those crops, that means our nitrates in that soil are way too high. So we need to be able to control those and co convert those back over. When we see thistles, and uh, John, what you're seeing there is because with white Dutch clover, you have a decent top root, you're opening that soil. So you're allowing aeration. And when we see thistles, that means you have anaerobic conditions underneath. That means we need to have more tap roots in our system. So it's, it's uh, one of the books I highly recommend is When Weeds Talk by J. L. McCammon. Wonderful book to, uh, to understand why these weeds are growing. That sounds fascinating. Thanks for that recommend. Um, uh, we have a question about where do you recommend getting cover seeds? And Tam says she has six acres just north of Edmonton. Well, because I'm, uh, I'm a little biased, I'm a, a cover crop consultant for Imperial Seeds. Uh, that's, uh, that's who we decided through Cover Crops Canada partner with, uh, been, you know, they're a really good company to work with. On the flip side, you know, to, um, to go down to the local, local uh, uh, garden center, that's an opportunity. Um, it's the biggest thing is when you're talking to someone, make sure that they have an, uh, some background of what species to be using. One of the first questions I usually ask is, what is your goal? And if people don't ask what your goals are, what you're trying to do and just say, oh, this is the cover crop, I'd be a little nervous about that. So um, yeah, you, you need to do a little bit of homework on the flip side. Uh, there's, there, if you know what you're looking for, there's a lot of resources online. 
Yeah, and we've used uh, places like spear seeds, uh, stamp seeds um, for some of our smaller kind of cover crop mixed seeds, more specialized stuff. And then just our local um, seed grain growers to get things like oats, barley, wheat, peas, faba beans that we mix in. And then if we have something, a plot that we're really just trying to control weeds in and we know it's only going to grow for a couple of weeks, maybe we'll take some of the grain we grew on the farm, barley and wheat, wheat, wheat and plant that in knowing that it's a cheaper option just to keep living plants in that root or in the ground um, until we till again. Um. Are there any more questions? It's pretty quiet in the chat now, but give you a few more seconds to type if you've got something going and then if not, we'll take a break in a minute. All right, I think that's it for questions then. Uh, this was really interesting. So thanks Kevin and John.